So today we're going to talk about evaluation of trade imbalances. Uh, we've been talking about balance of payments accounts. We defined the current account and the financial account. We've talked about the interrelationship between the two. Most importantly, we have identified the fact that the balance on the current account plus the balance on the financial account will always sum up to zero, as long as we account for all of the numbers properly, which we don't always do, but in theory, in practice, it should be right. And what that means is that we should be thinking about trade deficits and trade surpluses, not just in terms of what they mean in terms of goods and services flows, but also in terms of what they mean in terms of borrowing and lending asset flows, which is the flip side, which is what's going on on the financial account of the balance of payments. Now today, we're going to walk our way through a collection of thoughts or ideas about trade imbalances and how to evaluate or how to think about them. And what you're probably all aware of is that trade deficits have a very bad image. They're generally decried as a problem with a particular economy. Whoever's economy you're looking at, if it has a trade deficit, it usually is interpreted as, oh, that's not such a good thing. Trade deficits are viewed negatively, whereas trade surpluses are viewed often as a sign of strength, as a sign of economic power, as a sign of that an economy is doing well and is thriving in some particular way. Well, I'm here to tell you that Sometimes those observations are right, but oftentimes they're wrong. And that there are a lot of myths associated with trade imbalances that are perpetrated, continued, are spoken over and over again as if they are the truth, and they're really not the truth in many instances or in many respects. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you the logic behind how to think about trade deficits and surpluses and how to think about them a little bit more appropriately. Now, a couple of things that matter. One of the things that matters is this interrelationship between the balance on the current and the balance on the financial and the borrowing and lending that's going on. But a second thing that's associated with is this other concept we talked about last week called the international investment position. Because remember, if trade imbalances are telling you how much a country is borrowing or lending during the course of a particular year, international investment position is like the balance on the country's bank account. It's like how much indebted or how much credit they have extended to the rest of the world. And you can't really evaluate the position or situation of a country knowing one of those things but not knowing the other. And so we're going to look at that in combination and we're going to think about the pros and cons of trade imbalances. Now, the first argument, well first of all, let me start, start with kind of uh, just the semantics of the discussion. A lot of people don't really know what a deficit or surplus is. They're, they know vaguely that a trade deficit means you're importing more than you're exporting. Most people don't know that there's various ways in which you can measure that trade deficit, as you've learned in this class. But they don't quite know how to think about it or what to think about it. Now, for a lot of people who don't know much about it, if you just use the terminology, this country has a trade deficit. This country over here has a trade surplus. And you ask which sounds better, most people are going to naturally gravitate to saying, well, it's got to be better to have a surplus than it is to have a deficit. So the first thing working against someone like myself trying to give you an understanding of whether these are good or bad is that we've got the terminology that's kind of working against us. Deficits sound bad, surpluses sound good, and if you want to know kind of that, that perfect situation, then what could be more perfect than trade balance? Trade balance sounds ideal, like something you ought to be shooting for. But it really isn't. There's really no reason why a country couldn't or shouldn't run a trade deficit from time to time or a trade surplus. There's nothing particularly worrisome about it. And in fact, it's so little to be worried about, it would be like say, telling an individual, you know, you really should never borrow or you should never lend money. Because doing that is a problem, it's bad, it's going to put you into a situation, a bad situation. Trade balance is like an individual who never borrows or lends money. But we know that as individual households, borrowing and lending can often be in a very effective way to generate and capital and to generate for your needs and to allow you to do things earlier rather than later or to save money for the future. It allows you or enables you to do a lot of different things. And so it is the same way with a country that runs deficits or surpluses on trade. It's borrowing or lending internationally, and there's nothing inherently wrong with borrowing or lending. 
Now, the second argument that's commonly thrown out about trade deficits and surpluses, deficits in particular, is that uh, a trade deficit means that we're losing jobs. Um, and you'll hear this spoken by our presidential candidates or by politicians over and over again. And you'll, they'll get some support from think tanks around Washington, D.C., in particular the Economic Policy Institute, which will regularly publish that uh, the trade deficit that the United States has is costing the American economy something like two to three million jobs because of the fact that, as you've seen in the data last week or the week before, that we've got a trade deficit on an order of $500 billion per year. And they say that will amount to approximately two to three million jobs that are being lost to other countries in the rest of the world as a result of it. Well, their approach to estimating that particular number is flawed in a couple of important respects. And I want to suggest to you, I'm not going to prove to you this, I'm going to suggest to you that there's no real reason why a country running a trade deficit need necessarily have lost jobs. Now, the first misunderstanding that comes about is that national income identity I showed you in the first week or second week of class, where we show that imports are subtracted off from that C plus I plus G plus EX minus IM, and it looks as if, from that identity, that if you increase IM, and thus increase the trade deficit, all else equal, that that should lead to a decline in gross national or gross domestic product. But that's based on a misunderstanding of what's in that identity and the fact that when you increase imports, you're also increasing consumption or, and or investment and or government and or even exports to an equal extent, thereby maintaining the value of gross national or gross domestic product on the left-hand side of that identity. That identity does not tell us that imports increasing cause lost jobs. It's just not in there. Now, one of the reasons why people tend to believe this should be a valid claim, trade deficits cause lost jobs, is because they've seen it firsthand. They've seen an increase in imports come into a country, say in textile and apparel, or in the steel industry, and they've seen lower prices of foreign products cause domestic firms to face increased competition and sometimes to respond by closing down plants, laying off workers, and thus costing jobs in that particular industry. It seems, certainly, that as imports increase, we lose jobs in certain industries. So wouldn't it make sense that if we've got more imports than we have exports, that we must therefore be losing all of these jobs? Well, there's a couple of misconceptions there. Number one is you're looking at a micro story when you talk about steel jobs being lost because of the increase in imports. And yes, that indeed does happen. But when we measure the trade imbalance, the trade deficit, we're looking at the macro economy. We're looking at the entire economy overall. And we should recognize the fact that people who lose their jobs in some industries don't often stay unemployed forever. They might for a period of time. The transition is often tough, undoubtedly. But they will look for jobs in other industries, and they will move on, or they will retire, or they will move out of the workforce, and other people coming into the workforce as younger workers will not go into those particular industries, and they will take other jobs doing other things. The, in the, the economy is constantly churning. The labor market in the US economy is losing millions of jobs every month while gaining millions of jobs every month. There is a constant changeover of jobs being lost and jobs being gained. And what we're measuring in all of these instances is just the net effect. <coughs> all right, now I'll give you a little bit of data to suggest that maybe this notion that aggregate jobs are lost because of trade deficits might be wrong. And there's a graphic I can point your attention to in our reading. It's actually, let me go back one second. It's just clicking on that US trade deficits and unemployment file. It's going to bring up this diagram. Now, this diagram plots two series of data. The first series of data is the unemployment rate, which is in dotted red up at the top of the graph. It's measured in percentage terms along the vertical axis. So, for example, in 1980, the US unemployment rate was 7.1%. Uh, you can read it from the graph like that. In this point right here, this is 1992, the unemployment rate was 7.5%. All right, so this is the, the trend over what is that, almost three decades or so, from 1980 to 2012, 32 years of data. The blue line is the trade balance in the US economy, in particular, the current account balance. 
measured in hundreds of billions of dollars, where a negative value, negative 1, 2, 4, 6, means negative 200 billion, negative 400 billion, negative 600 billion in total deficit size on our current account. Now you'll see that this is under zero for the entire span from 1980 until 19, uh, 2012, meaning U.S. ran a trade deficit or current account deficit every year um, during that period of time. But let's look at the changes. And here's where you'd expect to see that if trade deficits cause lost jobs, and we're losing jobs every time the trade deficit is going up and vice versa, then we ought to think that maybe, maybe not, but maybe there should be a relationship with the unemployment rate. In particular, you might expect that as the trade deficit gets bigger, that we ought to have an unemployment rate going up because people are obviously losing their jobs because of the higher un uh, trade deficit. And vice versa, when the trade deficit comes down, well then, that ought to create jobs in the economy and cause the unemployment rate to go down. So now, the match isn't perfect, but let's just take a look at a couple of the trends. And notice that we had a high unemployment rate in the early 1980s. 1982 was 9.7%, 1983 was 9.6%. That was during the recession, the last serious, really serious recession that the U.S. economy faced. And it was after that time that our trade deficit started to increase in size. Remember, we turned from a creditor nation to a debtor nation around 1986 or so. And that was as a result of these increasing trade deficits that were getting bigger and bigger during the early 1980s. Now notice, after that height of unemployment in the recession, notice that as our trade deficit got bigger, well, not seriously so maybe, our unemployment rate was going down, 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 and down. Exactly the opposite direction you would think should happen if trade deficits are destroying jobs. <clears throat> now, notice that the trade deficit turns around and starts to become less serious, if you will, less negative uh, during the late 1980s, and that almost corresponds to an increase in the unemployment rate. So as the unemployment rate was going up a little bit later, the trade deficit was actually going down, getting closer to zero. Now, we have this period of time in here where we've got an ever-increasing current account or trade deficit from 1991 all the way to 2006. And during that period of time, with one hiccup, we've got unemployment rate falling down to as low as 4% when the trade deficit has gotten quite seriously large at $400 billion. And even at the very height of our trade deficit problem, if you will, when our trade deficit was close to $800 billion in 2006, our unemployment rate was sitting here at a rate of about 4.6%, which is not a very bad unemployment rate for an economy that at the time was pretty much booming along moving and, and, and operating quite well. We were not in an unemployment crisis and didn't have a problem, even though the U.S. trade deficit was very, very large. Now, what happened when the financial crisis hit in 2008? Well, look what happened to our trade or current account deficit. It fell precipitously. We stopped trading as much, and our current account deficit went down, got closer to zero, <coughs> right as we had a serious unemployment problem. Lots of workers were losing their jobs. Job growth was terrible, abysmal. And that was all in a period when our trade deficit situation was looking much, 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 much better. There seems to be no direct relationship between these two series. And in fact, they move in the opposite direction you might expect them to move if it was true that trade deficits caused lost jobs. Now, I will give you a couple of suggestions that maybe trade deficits cause lost jobs in some instances, but I would say it would only be if there is a drastic change in the trade deficit, if it changes suddenly and dramatically. Although even then, we've got the counter argument right here in the data from 2008 or so to 2010, which is we've got a dramatic change in the trade deficit going down at the same time as we've got a dramatic loss of jobs in the U.S. economy. Doesn't seem to be a close correlation between those, suggesting that maybe this relationship is not quite true. Now, I want to give you a more thoughtful, sort of logical explanation for why there may not be a close relationship between the trade deficit and the number of jobs in the economy. And part of that is highlighted by noting the way in which they're measuring the lost jobs that come about because of the U.S. trade deficit. 
And the way they do that is, we know a trade deficit means we're importing much more than we're exporting, right? Okay. So they say, let's look at the total amount of imports that we're bringing into the country, and let's identify like how many jobs are needed in order to produce, say, a million dollars worth of imported goods. And they look at the industry data, and they look at our import competing industries, they figure out how many workers are working in industries that are producing so much production, and they get a measurement, very crude kind of measurement between this much value requires this many workers. And you can then narrow it down to how many workers are needed, say, per million dollars of imported goods. They do the same thing on the export side. They say, let's look at our export industries, and let's figure out how much total production, how many total workers, and let's figure out how many workers per million dollars of exports. All right, then they match up the data and say we've got imports that are exceeding exports, so let's look at the difference between those and estimate some average between how many more jobs would we have in exports if we increase that, um, the number of exports to equal imports, or how many jobs would we create if we lowered our imports down to the export level. Let's find some average there and we will get the number of jobs that are being lost as a result of the trade deficit. That's how they do the measurement. Here's what's missing from the measurement. They're completely ignoring the fact that when you run a trade deficit, you've got a financial account surplus. The financial account surplus means money is coming back into the US economy through the back door, if you will, through, in, through and into the financial sector. Now let me give you a, uh, um, an obvious place where some of that money comes back in. It comes back in to buy US Treasury bonds or bills. <coughs> now, the government is issuing those treasury bonds and bills in order to borrow money to finance its deficit spending. It's spending more than it's actually bringing in in the form of tax revenues. It needs extra money from somewhere in order to, make, to pay the bills, so to speak. Okay? The way in which it does that is it issues treasury bills or bonds. Those treasuries are purchased by foreigners, and when the foreigners purchase it, they are receiving in exchange a very nice piece of paper if you will, that says U.S. government promises to pay you back some money in the future. The money they have, though, is coming back in on the financial account side that's going to the U.S. government. What does the government do with that money? They spend it. They spend it on government spending or they transfer it to somebody else in the form of transfer payments. It goes back into the U.S. economy and to the extent that, let's say, they spend it on defense spending or something like that, or spend it on the military budget, it's creating jobs in those industries that would not be there if they didn't have the borrowed funds that had come back through the back door in the financial account side. So what you're seeing with this lost jobs in the import competing sector that they're calculating is really lost jobs in one part of the economy that are being made up by created jobs hidden, not obviously because of trade, but created jobs that are coming about and are made possible because of the financial flows that come in that make their way in terms of payments to governments and to industries that then spend that money and create jobs in non-traded sectors. More job, fewer jobs here in imports and exports, more jobs over here in the rest of the economy. Sometimes there'll be an imbalance and we might lose a few jobs in the transition. Sometimes in the imbalance we might gain more jobs and the unemployment rate will go down. But on average, across an aggregate economy, there need be no great relationship between trade deficits and the number of jobs in the economy. So it's somewhat of a myth to think that there is this direct relationship and if that somehow magically we got rid of our trade deficit tomorrow, that we would create all these miraculous new jobs in the, in the, in the US economy. Now we might create more jobs in the export and import and competing sectors. Yes, traded sector but we would likely be losing jobs in other sectors if we artificially forced a reduction in the trade deficit to come about. <clears throat> okay, so that's point number one in thinking about trade deficits or imbalances. They're not really as job destroying as people would claim. Oh, well, well, why is that myth perpetrated? Why does it perpetrate? Why does it keep, why is there life to it all the time? There's life to it because there's certain groups in the US economy that would like it to be true and that per continually per perpetuate the myth that jobs are lost as a result. And the groups most responsible for that are 
import competing industries who are indeed threatened from any competition that they might face from both abroad and domestically, but it's easier to point your finger abroad and say that's costing us our livelihoods. And also workers that happen to work in import competing sectors or low wage workers that might be affected because of competition from lower wage workers in the rest of the world. So they have every interest to try to prevent competition from being expanded or extended because their job indeed is threatened in the, in the near term because of increased competition and trade with the rest of the world. But if we allow that trade deficit to grow, they might be losing a job in a sector, but they might be enabled to take a job somewhere else as a result of the adjustments that take place. Okay, so that's the first argument and discussion to have. The second is more of what I would argue is the proper way to think about trade deficits and surpluses. And that is to think about them in terms of the borrowing and lending that a country is undertaking. And in particular, to think about them in terms of the long-term consequences of running a deficit or a surplus. Now, I need to walk us through a couple of relationships to help us understand I'm going to go to the textbook, which is here. And I noticed in looking at the textbook lines here that um, there's some double writing that shouldn't be there. So this says the national income, this is in section 3.3. The national income identity, this is in the text version. I don't know if this shows up in the PDF version of it. But it says GNP is equal to C plus I plus G plus CX minus N. It says the same thing with GDP. The right relationships there should be GNP because we want to be working with exports minus imports being the current account because when we measure it that way, the flip side is always going to be the financial account and the borrowing and lending or asset exchanges that are taking place with the rest of the world. Okay, so the GNP identity is the right one here. And I'm going to write it up on the board here to duplicate what's up there. GNP is equal to C plus I plus G plus, I'll write it this way, current account, CA for exports minus imports of goods, services, income payments, receipts, and unilateral transfers. Now, here I want to draw the distinction and kind of carve out of this identity, this middle segment of C plus I plus G. And I want to think about and interpret this particular component and name it something else. The thing I'm going to name it is domestic spending, or DS for short. Now, the reason for highlighting this middle term, C plus I plus G, is domestic spending is because in actuality, this term here, just this component of our national income identity, is a better, has a better interpretation of the amount of consumption that's actually taking place by individuals within the economy. So let me go back to the definitions of this identity and recall that the consumption term here, which is the easiest to understand perhaps, is consumption by households on all goods and services but remember that it's incorporating imported goods as well as domestically produced goods. So when we measure that C term, we're measuring the total amount of goods that are being purchased and consumed and used up and generates pleasure and well-being to the, to the American public or to the domestic economy. So that's a better measure of consumption than just the consumption goods that the country actually produced because some of the goods we're enjoying are actually being purchased from abroad and that's actually added to our standard of living. It's adding to our total consumption. Same thing is true to an extent for the government term, because some of the things the government is spending its money on is, is maybe imported from abroad, but is generating benefits and is being done on behalf of the American people, you know, providing passport services to us in other countries by virtue of the fact that we have embassies there, and so forth and so on. So it's generating well-being, even though it might be purchasing foreign inputs in order to make those services possible. Now, the term that's the outlier here, it's not quite current consumption and generating current well-being, is the investment term. Because the investment term is goods and services that are being used in the productive process to help produce goods and services again for the future. So actually, investment is not being used up and generating benefits today, it's being saved, if you will, or helping to produce the goods and services that will help sustain our standard of living in the future. Very important, 
but it's not really a part of domestic or current consumption. It's not being used up to generate current utility for individuals today. But I gotta put it somewhere. I'm gonna put it into this mix of C plus I plus G. And remember that I is in the US is just 15, 16% of the economy, whereas consumption is up at 70%, government is up at 20%. So investment is a small component overall. It's not too strong an assumption to say domestic spending corresponds to consumption of goods and services by individuals in the US economy. Now, if that domestic spending is consumption, then we jump over to the left-hand side and recall what GNP or GDP is measuring. It's not measuring consumption, it's measuring, it's a measure of our production in the economy. It's how many goods and services are being produced. Now this becomes a critically important distinction because if we care about the standard of living of people living within an economy, what should we care most about? How much is being produced or how much is being consumed? Consumed. consumed. If I asked you, which would you rather do? Work all day and produce no or produce all day and consume nothing, or consume all day and produce nothing. Which would you choose? <laughs> Pretty easy choice, right? Consumption is what generates our well-being, not production. Yes, we need production in order to get to consumption most of the time, but it's not the same thing. So if we want to measure truly and accurately what is our well-being, what is our standard of living in an economy, GNP is misguided to a certain degree because we really ought to be spending our time thinking about what is the domestic spending component of a country and how high or low is that and how is it changing over time. That would give us a better idea of the average change in the average standard of living for individuals within an economy. Now, let's take note of the following. GNP is equal to domestic spending plus the current account balance. So they're not going to be equal to each other all the time, except in one instance. When is consumption and production the same? Yeah, when you've got trade balance, when the trade balance is zero, when exports are exactly equal to imports. So trade balance gives us the identity between consumption and production within the domestic economy. But what if we have a trade deficit? That is, the current account is less than zero. If a country has a trade deficit, then this number here, this value, is negative in the identity. And being negative, it means what's the relationship now between domestic spending and gross national product? If CA is less than zero, then domestic spending is greater than GNP. Or, to interpret this differently, consumption in the economy is greater than what we're actually producing. Or in other words, the economy is able, as an aggregate, to consume more goods and services than it's actually producing, thereby generating an even higher standard of living than is being reflected in its gross national product. Living better than it actually is able to because its consumption exceeds its GNP. Now, let's think about this one step further and remember that one of the reasons why you might be able to increase your consumption above your production level, your income, is because you borrowed money from somebody else in order to pay for it. And that's exactly what the country is doing. So when you run a trade deficit, you're running a financial account surplus, and what that surplus can mean is that you're borrowing money from the rest of the world in order to finance what? extra consumption over and above what your economy has actually been able to produce in that particular year. That's going to lead us to a slightly different interpretation of the goodness or badness of trade deficits in just one minute. But before I do that, let me say also that if the current account happens to be in surplus, so that CA is greater than zero, and that leads to the opposite conclusion, right? That gross national product has now got to be greater than domestic spending or production, how much we actually produce in an economy, is actually greater than what we consume. If your GNP is greater than domestic spending, you as an economy are not achieving, if you will, the standard of living on average that you could have if you would just consume out of your own production. You're consuming less. Now, what are you doing with the excess? 
You're parking it somewhere abroad. You're saving it in the rest of the world. You're running a financial account deficit. Saving money abroad, building up a creditor position. It's like you're putting money in the bank. So just like a household who decides not to spend all of its income in a particular year, but tucks some of it away into, it, into its retirement plan, the money tucked away in the retirement doesn't generate any benefits today, except maybe a sense of well-being and happiness that you're going to have some money, you've got money for a rainy day. But other than that, it's not creating any consumption for you today. It's being held in abeyance until in the future you're able to take it out and use it for yourself. So it is the same way with a country that runs a trade surplus. It's actually under-consuming relative to what it's actually producing during the course of a year. Now, let's put this into perspective just a little bit. The United States is running a trade or current account deficit this year, right? About how big is it? Anybody remember? Give me an approximate. About 400 to 500 billion dollars is our current account deficit. Based on this, what that means is that the United States is able to consume, as a nation, about four to 500 billion dollars more in goods and services during the year than the U.S. economy is actually producing. <coughs> Does that make the U.S. economy richer or poorer? Better off or worse off? Better off. In fact, what if we doubled it? What if we doubled the trade deficit, got it to $100 billion, a uh, trillion dollars? Um, then what would we do? Well, then we'd have even that much more goods and services to consume during the year. The bigger the trade deficit you run, the larger is your consumption over and above what your actual production is in the economy. You're actually raising your standard of living as a nation on average when you've got a larger trade deficit relative to when you have none, because you're borrowing money in order to finance it. Yes? Could you argue that you're actually making it more difficult for future generations to consume? Some yes, benefits? absolutely. And that's where we're going to get to in just a few minutes. So in the here and now, it's great. Overconsume, consume above your means, have a party, live it up, live better. Trade deficits are actually not so bad. Now, how long has the U.S. had trade deficit again? How many years? 30, 30, 35 years in a row. So every one of those years, the U.S. is consuming over and above its needs. And it's consuming more than it's producing. Every year, over and over and over again, we keep consuming more. Now, the good example I like, I've been presenting this data for many years. If we go back to the highest point of our current account deficit in the U.S., it was back in 2006, 2007, around there. And our trade in imbalance, our current account deficit that year, was about $800 billion. Now, our gross domestic product that year was quite a bit lower. It was more in the $14 billion range rather than the $17, $18 billion we're at today. Okay, but 2006, $800 billion, we were at like 6.1% of GDP, if you remember the twin deficit identity numbers, and uh, the largest trade imbalance we've ever had in absolute terms and even probably in percentage terms. <coughs> now, one of the things I did back in, that, in those years is to look at like how big is $800 billion and what other countries actually produce $800 billion worth of goods and services in a year. And the two countries that stood out in 2006 producing about that much was Brazil and India. Now, here's what that means. In 2006, the United States produced a whole bunch of stuff, $14 trillion worth of goods and services and consumed and used up all of it. And then it consumed an additional entire year's production of the economy of India on top of what was already being consumed in the U.S. economy. Now, how on earth could the U.S. consume that much more and be able to achieve that? Well, it borrowed money from the rest of the world in order to make it possible. There was a financial account surplus in that year, offsetting the current account deficit, therefore, we borrowed money in order to increase our consumption by an entire Indian or an entire Brazilian economy. That's a lot of extra consumption. And now, we haven't done that just for one year, two years, five years, ten years, but for 35 years in a row. 
All right, now we're going to get to the heart of the matter. Is that a problem or not? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on the circumstances. So let's think about what circumstances it might work out well, and under what circumstances it might work out poorly. And so I'm going to go to the notes again here, the readings. And we're going to work our way down to this graph, the series of graphs that I put together, diagrams. Okay, in this particular diagram, we're going to highlight the... We're going to make a couple of simplifying assumptions for an economy over two periods of time. We've got period one and period two. Those are the only two periods we're going to consider. Period one might be considered the present. Maybe it's everything now and over the span of 30 years or so. Period two is the future. Maybe it's 20 or 30 or even more years in the future. And so we're just going to kind of break down the time for a country into two distinct now and, and later kinds of uh, periods. On the graph, we're going to plot two distinct things. One is domestic spending, the C plus I plus G, or the consumption component in our national income entity. <coughs> and the second is the gross national product, which is the production component in our national income identity. Now, we're going to make two assumptions in this baseline scenario, which is incredibly uninteresting, but I'm going to walk us through it anyway. In the baseline scenario, we're going to assume two things. Number one, that the country runs a trade balance in both the first period and the second period. So exports are equal to imports, trade balance persists. And number two, we're going to assume that there is no GNP growth between the present and the future. All right? And then we're going to plot as a bar graph. What the bar graph is meant to represent is domestic spending. And what the line is meant to represent is the level of gross national product or production. So here's what it looks like. First period, we consume exactly equal to what we produce as a nation because there's no trade imbalance. In the second period, we do exactly the same. There's no trade imbalance. And so we consume what we produce continue to stay at the same size, if the population stays the same, per capita income stays exactly the same, nothing changes. Nothing interesting happens. Okay, but that's based on those two assumptions. Now let's change the assumptions. In particular, let's change the first assumption about trade imbalances. In the next scenario, I'm going to imagine that the country runs a trade deficit in the first period, in the present. Maybe it's 20 years of trade deficits, or 30 years, like the United States. And we're going to imagine that, then, domestic spending is going to de deviate away from the gross national product. We're going to imagine that that trade deficit is financed entirely by debt. So the country is taking out IOUs that it has to repay with interest at some point in the future, rather than selling off part of itself, rather than selling real estate or businesses or other assets, which is the other component that could be on the, on the financial account side. Let's keep it simple. Conceptually, it's just all borrowing. So we borrowed money in order to finance it. Let's imagine in the second period, you wait until the second period to pay anything back. It's like a balloon payment at the end. And you're paying everything back in the second period along with the interest that's accumulated on the debt you've taken out of the first period. Okay, so that's the assumption about imbalances. Second, we're going to assume that there's no GNP growth, just like we did in scenario one. Okay, so if we add that into the assumptions, this is what the graph is going to look like. Period one, the purple line, bar graph, line, domestic spending in period one lies above the gross national product. This is GNP 1, 2, it's the same in both periods. But we're able to consume a larger amount of goods and services than we're actually able to produce because the country ran a trade deficit, right? All right, that allows us to consume more, have a better time, uh, standard of living is higher on average per person. Everything is good in that first period. But we jump to the second period. Now, in the second period, all we know is that we have to repay the debt, right? We repay the debt with interest. Now, if we walk our way through logically and say if we repay the debt, what must that mean about our consumption relative to our production in the later period? Consumption has to be lower than production, right? Because you're going to have to take some of that production, you're going to have to pay it back to foreigners. All right? So consumption has to be less than production. What does that then imply about the trade balance in that second period? It's got to be a surplus on trade. So in the second period, we're going to get a surplus on trade, and that's going to correspond to the repayment of the debt. So here's what happens. 
The principal amount that we borrowed in the first period is corresponding to this bump up in domestic spending over GNP. Well, that's the principal that's being borrowed. And all of that has to be subtracted from the gross national product in the second period, and our consumption has to fall by at least that much. In addition, though, we've got interest payments, although interest today is like at zero, so there's not much of an interest payment in the future, like there was in the past when I did this graph. But nonetheless, there's some interest payments. And those interest payments are not giving you anything, really, except early consumption. It's not giving you any extra goods and services or anything like that. So that's going to drop your overall consumption that you can enjoy down a little bit lower as well. So that means your total consumption in the second period is going to be at a level like DS2, a little bit more than, than the principal bump up is going to be pushed down because of those interest payments you have to make on that debt to foreigners. You have to pay them back more in the future to compensate for them giving you consumption today. But that means if we look at the average standard of living that's achievable by this country who is not growing between periods one and two, consumption is high in the first period when you're running the deficits on trade, but they're much, 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 much lower when you're running the surpluses on trade in the future and you're in the repayment period. Now, this is the bad scenario, especially if we think about it generationally. If you think about the United States in this kind of scenario, what if the U.S borrows money like crazy for 30 years in a row by running trade deficit after trade deficit after trade deficit and then has to pay it back in the future. Who gets to suffer the lower consumption that's going to be necessary in the future when you're paying back that debt? Well, the next generation. The next generation is going to have higher tax payments, presumably, to pay for the government debt that has to go abroad and get paid back. It's going to have you know, it's going to have lower, um, well, it's, it's going to have higher interest payments, perhaps. It's going to have, in one way or another, people are going to suffer a lower standard of living. There's fewer goods to go around because the country as a whole is making a repayment of that debt that was taken out of the earlier periods. So this is the bad scenario and what we have to worry about. This is when trade deficits can go bad. Trade deficits for a long period of time that are too large, could be force you into a situation where you're, you know, you're lowering your standard of living considerably in order to make the repayments. Analogy. Let's put it in a household perspective. This is analogous to a household that borrows money by running up its credit card debt year after year after year until it gets to a debt level that becomes unsustainable. Nobody will lend them any more money. They can't continue the borrowing spree, and now they have no choice but to make hefty repayments on the debt if they don't want to default or, or declare bankruptcy. They live well during the period you're borrowing on the credit card. They live very poorly, and their standard of living is much reduced, and they have no money to do anything extra or fun because they're paying off all of this debt that was accumulated in the past. Maybe that's fine for an individual who chooses that, lot, you know, with full uh, foresight and knowledge about what the consequences are. It's not so good when you're talking about a generation of people who are living well and able to consume more, and a later generation of people who gets to pay back the debt that has been accumulated by the previous generation. Hmm, I wonder who the next generation is, you guys. <coughs> That's the bad scenario. Maybe we should be worried about that. But, hold on, there's a good scenario. Let's run case three. Case three makes the same assumption about trade deficits in the first period being repaid in the second period, but it adds an additional assumption and allows some substantial growth to take place in GNP between period one and period two. When we add in the potential for growth, we can get a picture that might look something like this. Now, this one is not so optimistic, perhaps, but it's not so bad. Here the principle that we're borrowing is this trade deficit over and above GNP1. But notice GNP2 has risen up to this level. And when we subtract off the principle and the interest payment, we still end up with a level of consumption that's above our period one production level. Now it's a little bit lower than our period one consumption, but not that much lower. And if we were to raise that GNP2 line even higher, we can bring up that purple bar 
to an even higher than level than it existed in the first period. So it's quite conceivable that with rapid enough growth of GNP, that an economy can actually accomplish a higher standard of living in the future, despite the fact that it has to repay those debts um, to foreigners in the future uh, on, the, on the money that it borrowed in the first period. So it's possible for this purple line to get pushed up even higher if this, this GNP line gets pushed up as well. The faster the growth, the less onerous is the borrowing that you've undertaken in the earlier periods. Yes? This is assuming that the, in the second period there is no borrowing. There's no borrowing. There's only repayment of debt taking place. Now, here's a way you can get around the problem a little bit, too. Let's suppose in the second period you say to the people who you, lent, who you borrowed money to, we don't have any money to pay you back. We'd like to, but we really don't have any. How about if you make us some loans today? We'll pay back what we owe today. And then we'll just pay you back tomorrow. <laughs> okay, let's roll over the debt and push it to a later period. As long as your creditors are willing to do that, then you might be able to even continue your borrowing a little bit today and maybe sustain that extra consumption for a little bit longer. But you need the willingness of the lending community in the, in the world to be willing to continue to lend you that extra money and push it off for the future. Yeah. Is this kind of what happened uh, to certain countries like Iceland or something where they lent all this money and at some point people started to believe they weren't going to be able to pay back so the interest rates went way up? Yes. And that, in this scenario... And suddenly everybody starts to pull their money out and say, hey, I don't want to hold any money in Iceland anymore. I'm going to pull it out. And then that suddenly causes a financial collapse, which happened around the financial crisis time in the United States as well, right? So did these... I mean, this is making an assumption that this nation or wherever this is happening is, is stable and, um, like the United States, deep uh, capital markets, they can absorb you things can like that. You can borrow and lend freely, right? Does this you can roll things over. What about a country like uh, Greece? Yeah. Oh. Okay, which scenario does Greece seem to be following? This one or the previous one? Previous one. Greece is in a predicament now because they have overextended themselves with international borrowing of euros. And when push came to shove and when the, the markets changed and they weren't able to repay it, they basically went to the commun international community and said, we don't have the money to repay it. And that led to renegotiations. Renegotiations normally involve a couple of things taking place. One is they say, we're not going to let you not pay. You have to pay it back. But maybe we'll let you repay 80% on the dollar rather than 100% on the dollar. We'll cut the total principal, we'll give you some loans to help you pay off what's due today, and then we'll push it into the future and let you pay it off in the future. But there's some conditions, right? What kinds of conditions are imposed? Well, you got to stop doing all the things that led you into the high debt situation in the first place. And for a country like Greece, that means cut government spending dramatically, take away lots of benefits from people, raise up taxes if necessary, balance the government budget, stop borrowing money, and squeeze the economy tighter and tighter. The standard of living of the average Greece, Greek person has fallen precipitously since the financial crisis and seems like it's headed no place but down in the foreseeable future. And it's because Greece has got this enormous external debt that it's expected to repay and it's trying to repay, but it's suffering from some dramatic um, squeezes in order to try to pull as much stuff away from the Greek people and transfer as much to creditors in the rest of the world as possible. Yeah. So how does Japan do it with 200% debt relative to Japan? They don't have debt. Japan has surpluses, credits in the rest of the world. Oh, you're talking about the government debt. Right. See, Japan is in this weird situation where they have government debt that's very, very high. A lot of it is internal and it's been borrowed and just recycled re, um, within the economy. Okay. So that's very, very high. But when you look externally, Japan doesn't have that problem at all. Okay. And in fact, Japan is a creditor country in the world economy. They've actually lent money in the rest of the world as a nation rather than borrow. Okay. 
It's kind of bizarre, because you'd think in order to sustain really high government deficits, you would have to get money from somewhere. Abroad would be an obvious choice, but at the same time, Japan has been lending money. I can't understand Japan, okay. despite my <laughs> attempts over the years. Yeah. Does that mean their debt is all um, domestically financed? A lot of it is, I, I, I'm quite sure of, yeah. Yeah. Question. I was going to ask if Japan's like borrowing money from its people and just letting it up. <coughs> That's the case. I don't know the source of the, of the lent funds to some degree, so I don't know. I don't know the internals of the borrowing and lending in Japan, but the, the sizes of the credit position, deficit position of national debt is enormous, and it's um, it's unlike most other countries in the world. So it is it's a rather bizarre situation. In the world. Yeah. A country can offset its debt repayment. If it's even other debt repayment can be really high. It can offset that with GMP growth, recipe. Absolutely. And this becomes one of the reasons why to get out of any kind of a predicament like this, the best way to get out of it, grow faster. Produce more, uh, increase the speed of GNP growth. We get into scenario three like we're presenting here on the graph. Things can be a whole lot, a whole lot better if only we grow faster. Now, let me give you some analogies that can help kind of um, make sense of this. I like the household analogies a lot. And one way to think about this scenario with respect to a household is to think about, well, any kind of an individual who might borrow money in order to finance their education. Some of you may know some people like that. <laughs> Does it make sense to do that or not? In the period of time when you're borrowing money to finance your education, counting your educational expenses, you're spending a whole lot more than your income most likely. And many people are. Let's jump to a scenario like a medical student. The average indebtedness of a medical student when they get out of med school is somewhere in the neighborhood of $150,000. And some are, have as much as $200,000 $250,000 in debt when they get out of medical school. Because they haven't financed just the payments for their tuition, they've also financed their living expenses and everything else for multiple years while they're in med school and then into residency and they put themselves in a dire predicament, right? Because they have borrowed all of this money. Well, maybe not. Because if you become a specialist and you become a cardiologist or an anesthesiologist or some high paid specialty, your income might be $500,000 or $750,000 a year in the future because of the profession you're in and the skills you've acquired. Now, if you end up with an income of $500,000 and you have $150,000 in debt, well, you pay that off over a number of years, and you could sustain the repayment plus interest and still live better because you have financed your education. Just like an economy, you have grown. Your income has grown dramatically enough so that the repayment is not a burden on that particular individual. Growth of income for an individual mimics growth of GNP for a country, if the income can grow fast enough, then the repayment in the future need not be detrimental, and you may actually end up in a better place in the future than you would have had you never borrowed the money, had you not as an individual gone to med school, had you not made the investments in an economy, you might never have gotten to that higher level of GNP in the future. <clears throat> now, here's where the problem comes in. What if you borrow the money and you don't spend it on something productive, like a medical school degree. What if you, as a country, just live it up and have a party? What if you take great vacations, you go skiing, you go to the Bahamas, you take cruises, you do everything, you borrow all this money, and then you don't have a degree, and your income isn't higher, and you're not able, then suddenly you're faced with an enormous amount of debt which is unsustainable and unable to pay back without enormously reducing your standard of living in the future. So as it goes for an, for an individual, it goes for a country. You can think about countries in African countries as a good example of countries that have underperformed economically in the, in the past, in the post-World War II period, while at the same time receiving <coughs> enormous amounts of loans and other types of aid from countries in the rest of the world. Think about the World Bank. What is their mission? Make loans to developing countries. Um, help sustain loans for private banks and help guarantee banks making loans to developing countries. To do what? To invest. 
to invest in infrastructure, to build dams, electrification plants, to be able to increase the infrastructure of the economy so that they will grow more rapidly. And as a result of that growth, their GNPs will be higher, they'll be able to pay back the World Bank and the other lenders and creditors uh, with interest and still be having a higher standard of living for their people in the future. But what if it doesn't happen? What if your intentions are good, but the results are not there? What if a country doesn't grow sufficiently fast, and yet it's taken out all of these loans for a long period of time, and the results are just not there? GNP has not grown. Now you have a bunch of creditors who've lent you money, other people's money, and they want to get it back. And the only way to get it back is to sustain a much reduced standard of living for what is already a very poor country, um, almost to the point where it becomes unbearable for countries to be able to repay that debt in the future. So those are, that's the simple logic, if you will, between trade deficits. Are trade deficits good or bad? It depends. There's no clear answer. What really matters about trade deficits, though, is the long-term implications of running them. Not really the here and now, whether you've got jobs created or job losses. That's all just kind of, it's not that important, if you will. It's not really the key matter in trade deficits. The key matter is, what does it mean for the future? And how does it affect the standards of living going into the future? Now, remember, too, that if you could choose just to have a trade deficit or a trade surplus, and all you cared about is raising your standard of living and having a good time, which is better to have, a trade deficit or a surplus? All else equal. Good. Deficit is good. A deficit is raising your standard of living above your actual production capacity. Best to have a trade deficit and have it over and over and over again, bigger and bigger and bigger, because if people are willing to lend you money to help you spend and keep your standard of living high, then let's say go for it. Why not? Especially if it's the next generation that has to pay for it. <coughs> now, what about trade surplus? Just think about those for a second, and think about a country like Japan as a good example. They, Japan is a good example in the sense that they've been running trade surpluses about as long as the U.S. has been running trade deficits. They have built up a creditor position in the rest of the world, meaning they've got like a bank account in the rest of the world. It's about equal to a little bit over, I think, 50% of their GDP. Okay, so they've got a big stockpiling of assets in the rest of the world which they could draw down and use for a rainy day, so to speak. Now, one of those rainy days that might be coming for Japan is the change in their demographics. One of the things that's happening in Japan, as is in many of the Western and developed countries around the world, is the populations are aging, right? Retired populations are growing very rapidly in most countries now, most developed countries. Uh, Japan is ahead of the curve. They are aging more rapidly or earlier than the United States is by about five to ten years. Uh, Japan is already a country that is declining in overall size. Their population is falling because they are not reproducing enough people to maintain their population at the same level. They don't allow much immigration to come into the country. So there's no influx of people at the young end to sustain the payments to the older generation in retirement. But Japan has one positive thing in their toolkit, and that is they've got this surplus, this creditor position internationally. So they have built up a bank account, kind of like an individual worker would do. You put money into savings. You put it into your 401k, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. You build up a savings account. Then you retire, whereupon your income goes to zero, or near that. And then you just draw on the savings that you've accumulated in order to sustain your standard of living at a reasonable level. Well, countries could do something like that, too. Trade surpluses, creditor positions can be created by running trade surpluses year after year after year. You build up a stockpile of assets, and that can, can help sustain your standard of living for rough times or for demographic changes that might come in the future. Yeah. So we're talking about this, the surplus, right? Is this the debt that they have, the, the, the money that they've lent to other countries? Or they're is it an asset? Lent. No, they've not lent money. Oh, wait, wait. 
Yeah, the money they have lent to other countries okay. that they're expecting to get back. So what happens so in the future? If in the future, right? And they, they say, okay, this is my rainy day. I'm calling in my chips. And like Greece says, yeah, I'd really like to pay you, but... Yeah, well, that's a problem with being a creditor anywhere in the world. Right. You know, you give your money over to somebody else, and they say, sure, I'll pay you back. But what if they don't? How do you get them to pay you back? Well, you use the legal system. You use whatever means you have to try to force repayment. You bring together banks. You have, you know, meetings. You try to force them to come to the table. You make, you know, if, but it can be hard because what if the money isn't there for them to give it to you back? So you could end up in a more precarious position sometimes because your savings might not be so safe. And that's a problem that Japan may face in the future, especially in this kind of rocky international scenario that we're now facing in the world. Absolutely true. Yeah? Could it also be an argument that if you run a deficit for such a long time, there's a point that you're not going to be able to pay it back? Yeah. I mean, the bigger the deficit, the more you're borrowing, no matter what your income level or how fast GNP grows, if it gets too big, then this is like a household. If a household borrows a little bit every year, even adds to its debt, but it never really gets out of hand, it's no problem. You can do that for a long period of time. But if you overextend, if you go too far, if creditors become too willing to buy, lend you too much money, like in the era before the financial crash, you could get a credit card from 20 different banks, and they'd all offer you $10,000 credit lines, and you could borrow, 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 and nobody seemed to be keeping track of what the other banks were doing, and consumers could get themselves into very difficult <laughs> positions very quickly. Countries could do the same. If countries, if creditors are too eager to lend to a particular country for too long of a period of time, the countries can end up in a bad position, just like a lot of the developing countries have ended up in over time, because a lot of loans have been made without the promising prospects really on the other side. Quick question. Yeah. Do you have an opinion about the United States and its future? Well, we're going to look at that <laughs> in the last 15 minutes or okay. so. Let me make one a couple of other points. That so there's four different scenarios that a country could face. I and mean, you should be aware of kind of what the circumstance kind of means in, the, in a general sense. So one situation is you can be in a debtor country, you owe to the rest of the world net, and you're running deficits. So if you're a debtor running deficits, it means you're increasing your external debt to the rest of the world. So you borrowed money, you got a credit card balance, and you're adding to that balance. Debtor country with a deficit. What if you're a debtor country with a surplus on trade? What does that mean is happening? You're paying it back. Yeah. yeah, you've got debt outstanding and you're paying it back. So you're lowering your debt position by paying back, paying off some of it over time. So that's what's happening in these scenarios here in the second period. The country is a debtor, presumably, and they're paying back that debt, running trade surpluses um, as a result. Now, that could be a bad situation. Trade surplus might be an indication that a country has been in a really bad debt position. Now they're paying it back and suffering an extremely low standard of living from what they're used to because they're in this period of repayment being forced upon them maybe quicker than they would like to, to, um, to achieve. So sometimes a trade surplus means just that, not very strong signal about what's going on in the economy at all. Third scenario. But if you're a creditor country, like Japan, running trade surpluses year after year, what are you doing? Investing. Investing or saving. We can say it either way. So you've got a bank account in the rest of the world. You've got savings. You've made investments abroad, and you're adding to those investments. You're tucking more and more money away into the savings account, and you're making more investments over time. Is that a strong position or a weak position for an economy to be in, generally, do you think? Strong. Pretty strong position, although the negative of it is you have to be suffering a lower standard of living relative to your production level in order to make that possible. If you're a rich country doing that, maybe no problem. But what if you're a poor country? And a good example of this might have been Russia after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Russia was an economy that was trying to get its economy going. They were running enormous surpluses on trade. And you might say, oh, well, that's because they're exporting so much oil and all that's good. But one of the things it reflected is that investors with, and especially the oligarchs with so much money, 
they weren't going, oh, and Russia's a great place to invest. Instead, they were saying, I better put my money into Switzerland or the United States or somewhere else. I'm going to save my money over there because I'll get a better deal and a better return on my money. It's safer if I put it there rather than investing back into the Russian economy. So sometimes you can have a situation where a country is lowering its standard of living because it's not reinvesting adequately, saving too much money abroad for its circumstances. Last situation, real quick, is creditor position with a deficit. What if a country has a creditor position that's running a trade deficit? What does it mean? What's that? They can draw from their savings? Yeah, you're drawing money, drawing down your savings. You've got a savings account abroad, you're drawing down, and you're able to achieve a higher standard of living today because you're living off of your savings. That's not a bad position to be in either because you've got the savings and you're drawing on it and allowing yourself to enjoy a higher standard of living. That would be a good position maybe for Japan to be in in years to come as they draw down their external uh, credit positions and help maintain higher standards of living for their retired population. Question still? How much do currency valuations play into this? <clears throat> it plays a role because changes in currencies are going to change the asset valuations right. abroad or domestically, and it's going to change what that net position is. When we move from year to year, we're making changes in valuations based on changes in stock market indexes around the world, and we're readjusting our international investment position accordingly. If we have a lot of debt externally as a country, like Japan, and then the Japanese yen, see, the foreign currency uh, decreases in value, so the yen increases in value, then all of those foreign investments are going to be worth less as a result of that. And so you're going to lose because you're holding a currency which is falling in value. Right. And that will affect the determinations here. Now, let's take a look a little bit at the data for the United States. So the United States, we know, is a, is a debtor country that has been running trade deficits for a long period of time. Let's take a look first at our international investment position again. Yes. Okay, so this is from the BEA, and this is the last quarter, first quarter of 2016, which is the last data we have for the international investment position. Our net IIP is $7.5 trillion, remember? So that makes the U.S. the largest debtor nation in the world. <clears throat> What's important is to look at the breakdown in terms of equities versus debt, though. And this graph, is table 1.2, has expanded detail. And it breaks down the assets and liabilities of the United States in total into functional categories that I want to focus your attention on. So first, let's look at U.S. assets. U.S. assets of $24 trillion. That, remember, represents the amount of basically foreign assets that are being held by U.S. individuals or governments or whomever. All right, so it means if, if a U.S. mutual fund owns some stock issued by British companies or German companies, that's part of the $24 trillion. If U.S. nationals own real estate abroad, that's part of the $24 trillion. You have nationals that lent money to somebody abroad or put their money into a foreign bank abroad, that's U.S. nationals holding foreign assets. $24 trillion. Now, take a look here. We've got direct investment at market value, and we've got it broken up into equity and debt. Equity is ownership shares. So that's ownership of firms by U.S. nationals, owning firms at least 10% in value or more. That gives them a... a controlling stake in the company, and that's what you need in order to be classified in the direct investment category. It amounted to $7 trillion, no, 5.8, sorry, $5.8 trillion worth of equities were purchased, or are being held, I should say, uh, by U.S. nationals abroad as complete or direct investment ownership. Let's look at line number 11. This is equity and investment fund shares that are portfolio investment. This is smaller investors. This is like the mutual funds or individuals as a part of their stock portfolio. They own a few shares of this and a few shares of that. You add it all up and look at the total values of holdings of all U.S. nationals abroad. It amounted to, what did we get? Um, $6.7 trillion. Is that right? Yes. Add them together, 6.7 and 5.8. What do we got? 11. 12, 
about 12 and a half trillion, right? 12 and a half trillion out of the 24 trillion dollars that's being held. Now, I've looked through all these other categories, and for the most part, they tend to be debt. They're IOUs, they're borrowing and lending that's taking place in various forms, they're bonds that are being held um, or issued by foreigners abroad and being held by Americans. So for the most part, we can break down, break down $24 trillion, about 12.5 of it is equity. The rest of it corresponds to some kind of an IOU that has to be paid back in the future, presumably with interest of some sort. Now, let's go down to U.S. liabilities. Now, that's $31.6 trillion, quite a bit bigger. That accounts for the $7.5 trillion difference. And let's look at the equities there. $5 trillion in direct investment equities and $6 trillion in portfolio equities. That's $11.1 trillion, pretty close to 12.5, which is what's going out on the other side. So foreigners have bought in about $11.1 trillion worth of equities. U.S. has bought abroad about $12.5 trillion, a little bit more abroad than here. But mostly, when you're talking about numbers in the tens of trillions, Mostly it's pretty close to each other, right? They net out almost to zero. What's left over is the borrowing and lending that's going in both directions. <coughs> if 11 trillion or so is being uh, moved for equities, 31 trillion is the total amount of foreign ownership of U.S. assets. That means about 20 trillion dollars <coughs> has been lent to the U.S. by foreigners. 20 trillion dollars. It has to be paid back with interest in the future. Now let's subtract off what's on the other side, the amount that foreigners owe us on the IOUs, and that's what, about $11.5 trillion. So 20 minus 11 and a half, that gives us a net, approximately, this is all back in the envelope camp calculations, that gives us a net of about $8 trillion that is owed to the rest of the world that has to be paid back principal and interest in the future. That's even bigger than the 7.5, but it's pretty close to the 7.5, which means that 7.5 is a fair representation of the IOUs that we have outstanding to the rest of the world. Now, 7.5 trillion, is that a big number or a small number? It's kind of big, right? 7.5 trillion dollars. <laughs> On the other hand, we've got to put it in perspective. And the way to put it in perspective, as we've done before, is to do it as a percentage of national income. It comes out to about, what, 40-some percent, 41 percent of GNP. Maybe it's a little bit higher because the borrowings are a little bit tilted higher. So maybe it's about 45 percent of GNP. It has to be paid back at some point in the future. Now, if we stretch that out over 20 years, 30 years in the future, we could probably pay that back without sustaining a very big drop in our standard of living each year in order to sustain that particular repayment if it all had to be happened soon and had to be done tomorrow. But we're not actually moving in that direction. We're actually moving in the opposite direction where we keep borrowing a little bit more and a little bit more and keep adding to this year after year. The concerning part about this was a little bit about the rise in that international investment position over the last five or six years. It's gone up from about three to four trillion dollars to about seven, from about 20 percent of GNP to about 40 percent of GNP over the last five or six years only. So that increase in our international indebtedness is rising pretty rapidly to a rate that might be a little bit concerning. Yeah. So if it is becoming concerning, and you have the numbers there, why do we keep borrowing? Well, remember that this is, we're looking at aggregate numbers, which are the culmination of lots of individual decisions being made by banks and by governments and by, so it's just all of them in total are leading to this conclusion. We don't have as much direct control over this like we would think. We can't just say, hey, I don't like that number, I'm gonna make it go down, because we've gotta affect the decisions of millions of different individuals to try to change that. The incentives in the economy are leading to this, and we can think about what is it that's causing that, and is it a problem that we should be concerned about or not? Now, let's put some perspective on all of this. The net international investment position for other countries. Hong Kong has the highest creditor position at 284% of GNP. 
Singapore, Norway is next, Taiwan, Switzerland, Saudi Arabia, all have more than 100% of GNP. Those are the saving countries in the world. We don't care about that so much. <laughs> Let's look at the borrowing countries. First of all, notice that we got all these countries here. The United States is way up here at, this was 2014 numbers, so 39%, we're at 40% or so of GNP. Look at all the countries that are worse off in terms of what they owe to the rest of the world. And there's been some comments about Iceland. So take a look, Iceland leads the pack with an external indebtedness of 400% of their GDP to the rest of the world. That's enormous and perhaps unsustainable, and I don't know how Iceland gets out of that example. Although, I don't know Iceland very well. The thing I've heard is that Iceland is really coming around and, and surviving itself quite nicely after the financial crisis. But they have a lot of external debt that has to be paid off at some point in the future, presumably. Now, look at where Greece is. Greece is third on this list from the bottom at 121%. We know they're in a difficult situation. It's not good. We know that Greece defaulting on its debt causes concerns and worries about maybe Portugal will do the same, maybe Ireland will do the same, maybe Spain will do the same. All of those are bigger countries than Greece, generating greater amounts of debts that would be reneged on and bigger problems for the European Union to bear. And but look at the size. They're over 100% of GNP is indebted to the rest of the world. Now, those are serious indebted numbers. And in fact, I would say anything over about 50% of GNP is getting you into the really worrisome area where you might be worrying about future generations and the drag that's going to be on the economy as a result of the indebtedness that a country has, has put itself in. The U.S., not quite there yet. Getting close and rising up rapidly towards that 50%, but you know, you can live, you can continue to live and thrive even though you get to 90 or 100 or 120, maybe not 120%. It depends on the circumstances. So there is no one magic number over which above is bad and below is, is good. The U.S. is in a precarious situation, perhaps. It has this indebtedness, but it also has an economy that is thriving and is deemed by a lot of the rest of the world to be perhaps the most dynamic and the most likely economy to continue to thrive into the future. If GNP growth continues to be reasonable enough and rapid enough, all borrowing problems are moot and uh, we have no real big concerns for the future. If they're not, if GNP slows down to a halt, doesn't seem to rise very much for the next 10 years or more. So we continue to build up more debt in the meantime because the rest of the world looks like a worse pace place to invest in, then we've got a real worry and concern about future generations. But that, I would argue, is the better way to evaluate the trade, and debt, uh, the trade deficit situation for the country. And we should stop thinking about all of this. Trade deficits cause lost jobs because it's just not a very... Uh, uh, informed way of thinking about the goodness or badness of deficits. So I'm going to stop with that.